All right. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Olivia. I'm a data scientist at Uber. Today, I want to talk a little bit about our A-B experimentation platform and especially the sequential testing methods where we implemented in our platform. Again, just to quickly reiterate, we constantly refine our features by running many experiments. Like, for instance, this is a experiment quite old on the writer apps where we tried out, OK, what if like we give writers an options to use cash to pay out for their rights? Do we actually grow our business? So we randomly select half of the users and expose them the options of paying with cash. And then we hold out the other side, the other half of the writers to a control experience. And then uh, we run ex experiments for a certain period of time. And then we have a bunch of metrics we want to measure. We are trying to see, OK, do we increase conversion rate of taking rights? Do we increase signed up rate? Because now it's easier to sign up without, even without you having a credit card. We also want to see if that helped the overall efficiency of our market. So we have a bunch of metrics we're trying to measure and we want to you know, compute what's the difference between the treatment group and control group and want to see if that difference is significant. Our infrastructure at Uber makes us to run experiments easy because we do have data almost flowing in to our database with less than 24 hours latency. So it's almost like real time. However, that also makes running experiments becoming more like a road trip. So, you know, like prepping the music, prepping for snacks before the trip is fun. Arriving is fun. The journey is boring. You just wait, sit there, you wait for the data to come in, and you know the data is coming in every day. So you or the product manager will just keep casting. What well, is today is the day. Is today, uh, do we have enough data today to make an informative decision on whether we want to roll out this product or hold back? Time to dig into statistics. Typically, the way we run experiments, we figure out we have treatment group and control group. We make an educated guess of how much difference between them that we try to detect, right? And I'm sure many of you have run some kind of power analysis before to figure out, well, how many samples do you need? How long does this experience need to take? So let's say an experiment say, OK, you know what? You need 10 days for you to collect enough data to answer your question. So technically, you need to wait for 10 days, which is if you look at the axis of the time, you'll be waiting till the, uh, the blue line. And then you run, let's say, a t-test, which is a black dot over there. And then you're essentially saying, all right, is that black dot greater than 1.96? Or let's say, you know, uh, less than minus 1.96. If it is, then it is, the result is significant. However, like I said, now that we have almost real-time data, if you're a good data scientist and you do your due diligence job, if you have a good experimentation platform that can help you rerun your analytic scripts every single day, then basically you can actually plot it your these test statistics almost like a time series. So every dot in that curve is essentially the t-test compared to random control using the data collected from the beginning of the experiments tell that particular time point. So what's the problem with that? All right, let's say we zoom in and then we go back in time. Let's say on day three, that's what you see. You see that your T statistics is 1.96, which is significant, right? So what do you do? Is that a runaway hit? A treatment effect so good not to be missed. A treatment effect so good that it's millions of dollars of increase, you should totally just roll out your feature. Or do we fall into the trap of multiple hypothesis testing? And what I mean by that is, if at each time point, you are essentially comparing your test result to a fixed, let's say, 1.96 constant boundary, what does that mean? That means every single time, you are giving a 5% type 1 error allowance to your test. You give it one today, you give another 5% tomorrow, you give it another 5% on the third day, so on and so forth. So if you just add them up, of course, your overall you know, top one error is going to go over the roof. And that's why uh, the experimentation platform team at Uber and I, we've implemented a sequential testing techniques that basically help us plan this allowance in a smarter way. So instead of giving just a fixed 5% allowance every time, now we take 5% and we figure out a way to distribute it over time. And then when I say it's a smarter way, I mean, we give really little allowance at the early stage of the experiments when we don't have enough data to really make a really good decision. So little allowance means that if you look at dash line, red dash line is our new boundary. At a, the first couple of days, the boundary is really hard to cross. You got to like triple your treatment triple your conversion rate to actually cross that line. And then the line gradually converge and then becomes more generous later down the road. So what do we get? So after we plan this distribution of allowance, 
We plan it so that you sum up all the overall to be 5%. So that means whenever we see that, if we actually see the time series of our data, whenever it crosses the dash line, I call it crossing boundary, as soon as we see that, we can call the winner and say our data is significant. And our overall false positive rate, meaning that the chance that our data ever, ever crossing this red dash line is well controlled by uh, the threshold you set, in this case, let's say 5%. And because I can claim my significance at any time when I see it's crossing, what does that mean? That means my experiment is not confined to that fixed sample size that I planned before the experiments using some of the assumption that I'm not even sure if it's correct. 